There's no substitute for that. You can't be a little bit, oh, you can't be a little lazy. Can't get somebody else to do it. So, like, when I talk to the kids, I just talk to them about faith and hard work. You got those two, and there's no way you're going to be. Like, you, you can't be stopped. Today we sit down with Coach Fran Brown, the new head football coach at Syracuse University, a key figure in Georgia's 2022 national championship team and the nation's top recruiter, Coach Brown, shares his inspiring journey, coaching insights, and exciting plans for Syracuse football. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Stay tuned. You won't want to miss this. Coach Fran Brown, we're pumped to have you spend some time with us today on our podcast. For those of us who follow college football, we know you spent some time at Temple and Baylor, but where you really became known for your recruiting was at Georgia, a perennial powerhouse and national championship winner in 2021 and in 2022 when you were a coach there. This led to you being hired to bring back the luster to the program at Syracuse University. But our podcast is not concerned with the X's and O's of football. We want to share your unique story because if people don't know who you are now, just wait. Let's start from the beginning, which is humble by any standards. First off, I'm honored to be on. Let me go back and start from that. I'm truly honored to be on here. But uh, everything really started from growing up. You know, growing up in Camden, New Jersey, I had a chance to play for Sambo Sambos. Uh, was my low league team. I remember the first time I went out to a team. I got to play. I played defense event my first year in Titan. Then I made my way to the backfield. And I'm, from there, I played five years of low league football. Then I got a chance to go to high school. I played quarterback on varsity as a freshman, which I never was a quarterback. I actually went to quarterback because we had too many running backs on the team, and I didn't want to be a backup. So I went to play quarterback, and it worked out. He actually moved me. All the way up to Bar I played Bar for four years. Um, I went to Western Carolina. I went to Hudson Valley for one year. I did one year at Human College. Hudson Valley, and you know, I went to Western Carolina, where I got to start there for three years. And um, and I got literally an opportunity to go play with the Bengals for one year. I got cut off the practice squad. Then I went back again, and I was cut again. So I was all, nowhere near where you was at. You see, it's the grain, but... um. That was like everything I wanted to do. I didn't know what I would do from there. I became a substitute teacher. I coached Murray football. I was a freshman basketball coach. Um, and I was just fine. I was married. I had one son. And that was a lot of work. You know, I was substitute teacher and freshman basketball. I was training the kids on the side. I worked at a hospital called uh, Youth Penn over in Philadelphia, where I was the manager of the environmental service department. And I remember doing three different jobs just so I can make $84,000 a year. And my wife, I just became a RN. And between the both of us, we just bought our first, first home. And we were making like $150-some-thousand. And we were just excited about life. Opportunity opened up. My degree is in felony justice. So I had an opportunity to work for the prosecutor's office in Canada. And then also an opportunity opened up for me to go over to Temple and work for player development. And, uh, a guy named Moulton, he played running back at the Eagles a long time ago. and Had a son named R.J. Moulton that played uh, college football. He said, you'd always be able to work in the prosecutor's office. Go get involved in football. And now when I go back and I look at it, that was 2013, 2012. It's 2024. 12 years later, I'm going to have football coach at Syracuse. When you were growing up, I know your uncle was a big role model for you. Can you describe him to us and maybe give a story about the kindness that he showed you? So my uncle Charles Brown, he was a camera police officer for some time. And I'm just talking about, you know, I didn't have a father around. My mom had four boys before she was 21. He went to the Marines. So he was in the Persian Gulf War, came back from there. And just like, you know, everything you would look for in a father, he was there for me, but he was my uncle. It wasn't much older than I'm talking about going to sparring teacher conferences, signing us up for football, signing us up for basketball, taking us school shopping, buying us clothes. I mean, just any little thing there was. My mom not having all the bill money she needed for rent and to do things, he would always be there. And, um, he just really showed me what it was to take care of your family care and to put other people first. You know, I watched him just always put everyone else before himself. You know, he would 
give me all of his clothes when he would go buy clothes. Because when I got to high school, we we're about the same size. He'd give me all of his sneakers and all of his clothes. And he'd just go get different things. He just taught me to be a blessing to others. You know, that's really what I really go back. I think about my uncle showed me was to do a blessing for others. And just work really, really hard. Co- Coach, going back a step, though, when you, 12 years ago, he said you could do something criminal justice for football. How do you go from, you know, what what made you leave the three jobs, eighty four thousand dollar, you know, that you had to go into to take the leap of faith and go into coaching? Um, I just really want. I, I went to a football practice one day at Temple because uh, Matt Lewis was at my he was recruiting me to play at Western. And he said, "Just come over, you'll like it," because I was training a lot of good players too. So he's like, "Come over, you might like." It. I went over, and I went to a practice, and you know how it is when you play football. I just got the itch again. Couldn't play, but it was like, dang, I might have an opportunity to be a part of something. And I went from that February all the way to August until they hired me. I just showed up every day. Just kept coming up, kept showing up, kept showing up. I showed up every day. I didn't know if I would get a job or not, but I stopped substituting and I kept my evening job and I couldn't. And I was just going over there. And I was just hoping that something would happen. And in August, they told me they was about to me as a player development. And they announced me to be uh, a player of development. And uh, it changed my life. It was one of the best things that happened. But you know how it is. When you want something, you just go work. And it was faith and all work. It was all faith. Like, you know, we wouldn't be here without the man above. So it was just faith. I had my unbelievable, I'm wavering faith. And I just worked, worked, worked. And then the answer, it, you know, just like me sitting here with all football coach at Syracuse. With, I'm on here with Tim Gray. And I got Art Monk's Hall of Fame jacket behind me. Like, you know, it's just faith and just hard work, you know, for those things like that to have. I know Camden, New Jersey was a rough place to grow up. Can you give us some examples of how rough it really was around you? Like, um, I mean, it's really rough, you know, and everyone gets on and they tell you different stories, but, you know, I grew up a bunch of friends that I literally grew up with that I would play basketball with on the court that you had or murdered before we hit high school. You know, different things that make sure before we left high school, more guys got killed, more guys went to jail, done different things of that nature. So we got to think, for me, the age of 12 to 19, I lost a lot of friends, either by being murdered or going to jail for a, a long time for maybe murdering someone or, you know, just getting involved in things that they shouldn't have been in. Um, by me having an uncle that I had and my uncles, you know, it was a bunch of different ones that I had, Uncle Troy, Charlie, Wayne, my, my dad's side. Um, Uncle Kennedy was just a bunch of different guys that um, stepped in and tried to keep me on the straight and out, you know, and keep me away from it. Did sports help keep you out of trouble when you were growing up? Absolutely. Because when I would be on the same street that they were doing negative things on the street, I was just up there playing basketball. Or I'd be doing different things where I wouldn't go down the other end. You know what I mean? I'd be down there, but when I might be down there around it, just kind of like, oh, I ain't doing that because you can't fall and chill and just stay here. You wouldn't have to go do the things that it took sometimes to make a little bit more money. Naturally, those things would just give it to you because they felt as though you had a chance to go and do something in your life. You know, so keep you away from this. Don't do that. Don't be there. But, you know, when you're around it, like, nowadays, sometimes you got to fit in with certain spots, but you can be able to fit in, but you don't got to do what they have to do. And that's what I learned how to do. I learned how to be with them exactly here. But I'm not really there mentally. You know, I'm just there. We're around. We're hanging out. We've done all the same thing. But I know what I want in my future. You know, I saw a bright future. I didn't see staying out here trying to make money and ended up being in jail or mentally murdered. You know, I saw a white kids. Did you ever kind of, I guess, inch towards that lifestyle and your uncle or your mom or somebody kind of grab you and put you back on track? Or did you always know to stay away from it? Uh, absolutely. I mean, of course, you're around the every single day. You see, I'm getting all the money and those guys going different things. So you always want to and get at it. But then, you know, it was just the respect in my family. So the respect in my last name where I was told, you know, you can't do that. No, nah, we can't do that with you. You're not going to be able to do this. Your people will come out here and act funny. Or hey, you need to stop. People know what you think you're doing, but it's not going to happen. So, you know, all you want to see, but as soon as you went to go make that move, not and not allow you to do that. I know you, like me, consider meeting your wife as one of, if not the best, things that's happened to you. I'd like to know where you first saw her, what you said, 
And how come it took you so long to make her see the light? <laughs> All right. So first off, she must have been concussed because she did for a lot, you know. So she must have been concussed for a while. But so the first time, my same uncle, I'm always talking about my uncle, was dating one of her older cousins. Um, and they were in Camden at somebody's house. Cause my wife's from Woodbury. She's not from Camden. But she was down there. My uncle said, come over here with me. There's a little girl around there also. So I went around there. I seen her and I was like, damn, like it was just something about her. She had those beautiful eyes. Um, and she was really beautiful. She was just pretty, like really, really pretty. And I tried to talk to her. Uh, she would barely was talking to me. So I'm like, all right, look, I'm about to go get a car. Now I want to do this. I'm in ninth grade. So I'm leaving. I'll be back. I'm going to get a car. And then we'll go. She told me, yeah, okay, go cool, come back. She think I'm lying, but I'm in Camden. So I go get a car. I come back. I go around there and pick her up. I said, yo, what's up, you buddy? So I'm not getting no car with you. No way. So we walked to the Chinese store together, got some food to eat, came back. And then um, she wouldn't give me her phone number. I didn't talk to her. I seen her again at a party. It was after Woodbury High School won a championship. This was 1998. They won a championship. So I see her at a party. I'm like, uh, what's up? Like, I danced with her literally the entire party. I would not let her leave. would not let her go dance with anybody else. I literally just danced with her the whole time. Then um, I tried to get her to come leave with me again in the car, and she wouldn't do it. So then when I seen her at a concert, it was uh, a concert down in um, in Camden at the Tweeter Center at the time. She seen me there. She ran up, gave me a hug, and then she just gave me her page number. It was like, I'll just give me a call. And I said, yeah, I was lifting a little bit of weight. So I like to say it was the weight room, and she came to her senses. So we ended up talking that day. It was June 19th. I called her on June 20th, ended up paging her, came back. And we were on the phone for like three in the afternoon to probably like two thirty in the morning. I fell asleep on the phone when I got back up. I was like, "Yo, I'm not hanging up until you, my girlfriend." And she told me she wanted to go with me. Then it was June twentieth, nineteen ninety nine, and coming up this June twentieth, we've been together now twenty five years. I'm married nineteen on June twenty first, so it's a big big force coming up. You know, then twenty five years getting together, nineteen married. So. She's tried, to leave me. She's tried to leave me probably 19,000 times and I won't let it go. <laughs> that's, that's how you became a good recruiter. You had to, you yeah. had to trick her early. <laughs> oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. I was still recruiting. I just recruited her all last night. She was mad at me. I ended up talking to her and going out to eat with me. So. Can you tell us what attracted you to Western Carolina? Also, talk a little bit about Hudson Valley Junior College. All right. So Western Carolina, honestly, they wore purple and gold like my high school and their names was on the back of the jersey and they was playing against NC State the first game. That's why I went to Western Carolina. Matt Rue was cool, you saw to me, but I went to the school because I got I would have had a chance to go against T. A. Mc uh Lendon, Jericho Cotri, all those guys that was at NC State at the time, Philip Rivers was the quarterback. So I went literally so I could play against them. That was the first game. And our names was on the back of the jersey and we were purple and gold like my high school. So, like, literally, that's why I went, but it was the best thing that happened to me. That was just really God. I went for one of the most immature reasons that you can pick a college for. But God was working on me. So, you know, I think it was just working. Uh, Hudson Valley was really, really hard. That was the hardest time of my life. Aside of that, as a senior in high school, I was held back. But that, you know, I went to Hudson Valley. I went up to school with a tub. I don't know if you remember the tubs that, like, people put clothes in if you put them away for winter. Like, I went there with a tub. It was a small TV and half of the tub that had the VCR in it. I had a pair of cleats and about five outfits. And I remember getting on the train, and I called the train to school, and I was like, I can't go home. I went and I got my associate's degree in one year, but I'm talking about you know, I barely had money at school. My financial aid wasn't filled out right. So they was almost about to kick me out. We had to do it all over and work with I just the lady that worked in the financial aid department kept helping me. My wife was sending me stuff, a couple of different cousins. Um, it was like tough. Like I remember I would go to sleep and my wife should tell you this. I would drink a gallon of water and go to sleep that night. My the water would help my stomach be full. The next morning I knew I had a little guy that was cool with me that worked at Dunkin' Donuts. So he would give me a bunch of stuff. And that's how I would have, like, my breakfast and my lunch. But I used to just go across the street. We had this field. I was going to work out all night. 
Like, I remember running in that field, that little hero, just crying about, I want how successful I wanted to be, crying about, like, I need a scholarship. Like, I got to go to college. And it all worked itself out. I met Matt Rule. He didn't really want me to go to school there. I bribed him and talked him into why he should take me because I was taking 18 credits as a during football season. I was staying up there over the Christmas break. I was going to take six. I was going to take 15 again come um, uh, spring semester. And throughout the summer, I was going to get 12 credits and I would graduate. And I was like, I promise you, I'm going to do it. And he told me, he said, no one else ain't had a plan like that and just told him that. And being able to stick to it and do it. And I did it. Literally passed all those classes, went through it all, got my associate's degree. I graduated there within one year. And then I headed off to uh, Western Carolina where I got to play for three years. And going to Western Carolina was a culture shock, but it was just what I needed to be able to adapt all over the world. You know, I was just from up north. So it was comfortable. I was just about me, me Jersey, really South Jersey and Philadelphia. That was my everything. But I got to go to Hudson Valley. I got a chance to now be around everyone from New York, upstate New York, all around New York, you know, different spots. And then I went to Western Carolina and I got to see the South. You know, I got to be around different guys that I met from South Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, Alabama. It's some of my closer friends now for the rest of my life because of being in college. You guys know how it is. Man. You share that time with them and you put that time in and you uh, run together, watch summer workouts, just all the things that you hate, but she would have made you the man you are. I um, mean, I just, I wouldn't change what I went through for anything in the world, but Hudson Valley is hard. And it was like testing because so many guys came there and so many guys flunked out. They weren't like just able to just focus, but I just knew like, I can't go back to Camden. So literally it was, Dominic is, I'll take your ass back to Camden. I wasn't going back to Camden because I knew what I would end up in the afternoon, so I just locked in on that, and I just kept pushing and kept riding and going. And my wife stuck with me. Like, that's why I love her so much, because I'm talking about, I didn't have any money. She was working at Friendly's at times and would send me stuff. You know, and like different things. And I would call out different, my uncle and different people like that that was going through stuff. At this point, my uncle was going through a little something that he went through. So it was a lot that was off. But I was just trying to figure out how to make it, you know, just different people from my city. Y'all. That's why I love Camden so much. Different guys with so many stuff, getting different clothes and guys that I wore their size and stuff that was probably outside doing some of the wrong things. I want to say their names and stuff and put them out, but they know who they are. Was like, give me their old clothes and give me different things. Just stuff like that. That That's why I'm happy I'm a head coach now because I can tell a lot of the young people. I just think I give a lot of hope because it's like, hey, don't worry about what you don't have now. Don't worry about all those things. Just keep pushing. Keep your face and keep our work. You know, all the work you see about. You place such an emphasis on education. Where did you gain that wisdom? Because uh, I got held back as a senior in high school. I did not go to class. Like, I, I played tonk all day long in class. Like, I went into the hallway, we would cut class, I went to roll back. And then when I went to college, I thought this daughter needed to catch up. I thought this daughter, there was a lot of people ahead of me. Um, you know, they, they were born with different IQs, in my opinion. You studied harder, they had different pieces. So it was more so let me do, let me go really, really hard at this so I can catch up. And then now, once I did that, I realized, like, dang, this is kind of the key to being successful in life. And that's why I push at our players so much. And I'll tell you, like, I don't mess around. When it comes to class, you miss a class, it's an issue. You know, I'd rather you drop the game when it touchdown. down. Then you throw this class because I know that game winning touchdown. Yeah, the comp. You know, that happens with life. That might be something you need. But when you go fail that class, that one class could have changed your life. And you get this degree, this degree won't keep with you for 50 plus years. You know, you get memories of football, things are up and down. But my, I wouldn't be the head coach and I wouldn't be talking to you right now, Tom, if I didn't get my college degree. Did you have a coach that got on you about it? it was did Matt Rule? I mean, we mentioned his name a couple of times. Did he get on you about it? Or you kind of, it sounds like you, you nah, actually got it together. I was not there. Like, I was, I ain't even about it. You know what I mean? I'll be there and start about learning stuff. Like, I wasn't, like, you got to come to Camden with me. You know what I'm saying? You got to get around <laughs> it. You know, you get around it and you see it. Like, I could go where I want. Everyone loves me in my city. I did a good job of just staying neutral to everything and being around them and going. But, like, when you in there, that's really, you know, people always talk about from the mud and I'm this. That's why I don't kind of talk about it because it is what it is. But, um, you know, I'm saying, you know, I'm not going back. 
I know you might be crazy. He's like, lock in. You got to do it. You already did that. And you see where that led to with all the other guys that didn't go to school and go on this. So, like, what will make you do that same thing? I think you should truly, truly, truly learn from the guys that went before you. You give you everything. So, like, why would I make the same mistakes that those guys made? And everybody go back home and I see them back home and end up hating their jobs and hating the kids. I was just like, you know what? I'm going to do something with When did you know that the game of football would be your way out of Camden? Honestly, once I left to go to uh, junior college, because that second senior year, I was just playing. You know, you hope to go somewhere. Everybody said it morning. I loved football. But that's all I knew. But you seem kind of like everybody would just come back. You'll come back. It was a good friend of mine. We were really good friends. Still, we call each other cousins. I mean, it's one of my best. Yeah, you know, you know, the one way he was a six round draft pick, and just seeing Juan go get drafted, and watching Juan go do the good things, and just seeing all the stuff around him, it motivated me more than anything. You know, and it was just like, okay, you know, this somebody that I grew up with. He just got picked in the sixth round. Even if I don't end up being this Hall of Famer football player, which I'm not, I know I can find a, a life in football. You know, I can do other things to it. Or he's motivated me to work. If he motivated me to work, it's by Sam B. You know, watching him get drafted and watching him first, just seeing the grind that he went through and where all grind his motivation. You know, I forever owe him that, like, just... And being drafted, and being such a superstar, it pushed me to like work, you know. And it wasn't towards like, no, oh, I want what he got or jealousy. No, it was that theory, like, damn, he was running dormants. We grew up together. Like, you really used to be at the pool with me. And like, he did this, like, I don't know, I was just so thankful, you know. And like, that, you got like, dang, he just keep did that. Like, it just gave hope to a lot of people, you know. And I was just like, man, I will, I will always be, like, forever be just thankful for him. And for his accomplishments, because his accomplishments allow me and my family to be able to live the way he lived now and work the way that I want because of what he. I know that you try to be a devout Christian, as do I. To us, that means that we accept Jesus as our Savior and that he died for our sins. So, what do you say to your players with different faiths or no faith at all? When they have different faiths, I say, I'm just, I'm, first off, I'm happy that you. Believe in someone higher than yourself. I can't tell you what you usually need to pray to or what you need to believe in, but continue to know that it's bigger than you and it's higher than you, that you're higher up. So as long as it's someone, I'm happy for. You know, I'm happy for them because there's an opportunity that I'll get a chance to see them again in heaven. When they don't believe in anything at all, that's when I try to invite them. And that's when I push them as hard as I can to. You know, be a part of this, man. Success comes through that. It's faith and hard work. And I always tell them this. Faith and hard work can't be substituted for anything. I love my wife to death. But when it comes to my faith and believing in Jesus Christ and God, if you take Jesus Christ away, my wife can't replace him. You know, I'm not saying she'll be replaced because I don't want her to cuss me out from being all here talking about she'll be replaced. <laughs> but what I'm telling you is, he can't be replaced. There's no substitute for that. Hard work. There's no substitute for that. You can't go a little bit oh, You can't be a little lazy. You can't get somebody else to do it. So, like, when I talk to the kids, and I just talk to them about faith and hard work. you got those two, and there's no way you're going to be. You, like, you, you can't be stopped. You know, it's important that you just buy and get pushed that way. That's just like, you know, I'm always on them. And, and a lot of times, honestly, you got to be able to motivate them and motivate them financially to get them closer to Christ's face. And you got to do what's needed because that's what God puts there at times. Like, okay, and this is the way you get to that heart to get them to push this way. And you can make a lot of money. He said, well, come to me and this is what I've done. You know, I've done this because of God, you know. And I, you know why I got this much money? Because of Christ. Because he knew that he could use me as a blessing. And I'm busting my butt to try to get you close to him because that's my real job. To get all these young dudes closer to Christ so that way they can make it to heaven. And I want them to know their job is to bring it next guys want to be able to do something. So it works. So um, like I'll ask them this. Would you rather have a belly at 20? Do you want to be able to afford a devil at 21 or 40? And all of them say 21. I say that's cool. 
But I'd rather use that for you because it means you was able to stay. You did it the right way. You were able to take care of the money. You got the day. We must believe in a man above. So everything's working out for you the right way. I think that I only understand what that mindset is. And then you're able to get the Christ into it. And this is no better feel. Me going out there and I'm locked with arms with a bunch of men that believe in the higher up. And a lot of you believe in Jesus Christ. I don't mean not successful. You know? We were talking to somebody, a uh, coach on the podcast, and they were talking about hard work. And it kind of sounds similar to what you're saying now. He said, um, through hard work, I'm going to paraphrase here because I'll, I'll mess up the quote. It's a really good quote. But he said, through hard work, my glory can be delayed, but not denied. I agree with that. Yeah. I wanted to be a head coach at the university, at Temple University, like four or five years ago, and I was denied it. And then I wanted to do it again about three years ago, and we, I didn't get the opportunity. And I was like embarrassed. I felt down. I felt at it. Because I had a bigger plan for you all along. You know, you had a whole different plan. I go back and look at it, I'm like, wow. You always let me know what's right. You always right on top. Because I wanted to do something there and wanted to go. And I think, I, I really believe God said, nope, that isn't big enough. And you want a bond. So I need you to get a little bit more humble. Understand that I'm doing this and not you. And then once I understood that, and also, I don't want you right in Chile because it's right next to Camden and it's too close to home. Put you four or five hours away where people are not going to ride that much. Dude. You know, once I became that coach, I got a lot more cousins now. <laughs> a lot of people want to be cool. So there's a big difference now. So I just think God was doing what he felt would be best for me and for my family and for me to continue to be a good husband, a good father, a community man, to be able to take care of the team and lock in on the team and lock in on the new community I have here instead of trying to be completely involved and touch everybody when it comes back to my own city every single day because I got a big heart. Coach Brown, I bet most people that don't know you will be surprised at how you order the priority of your players, given that you're in Syracuse to win a championship. Can you tell us how you recommend your players organize their lives? So basically, I, was, I, I send them a study and I make them fill out a detailed study to help them out. I make sure that they're praying every day to get something from me and we lock in on our prayer. First and foremost, happens in the day before we start the evening off. Guys, we got prayer and we go out loud to each other. So I think we're locking on faith and they understand that. They're locking on their family and they understand that that's important. They're locking on academics and the community. And you feel locking on your faith, your family, academics, and the community. And you can put all of those things before you to become the man. And the more men I get on the football team, they're going to beat a lot of little boys. Men beat boys. So it's like, you like, you like, you know, things, you have that, of course. Families are all right, checking on them, doing everything I'm supposed to. Academics, you've got the part. I care about the community, I'm doing everything the right way. Those are the things that men do. So when I get young 18 to 22 year olds to start doing that and to think like that, and then it becomes second nature, and that's how they live on a daily basis, and we're going to be able to do what we need to do football wise. You know, like I always tell them, no disrespect to the audience and all the things that you've done, but I'm here to do what they've done in 1959. Because I know that that will bring joy to everybody. Now, that's what my goal is, to be able to do that. That's why they had all these pictures in office. When I got here, it's the only picture I thought of. 1959, Lou Brady, so I'll make sure that I put that up there. Over the top, over that temple. What's the name? Well, Muhammad Ali, I got that picture myself. I like that a lot. They get sense, keep going. You know, don't stop. That's what I want to do. I've been able to get a taste of it. And I think we need a taste to end up more. You know, what did you aspire to be as a kid growing up in Camden? The NFL football player. I wanted to go to the NFL. I wanted to play in the National Football League ever since I was 10 years old. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do. I was working my butt off. There's a guy that we were able to work for us. I mean, he didn't want to score. He got to be in the main of Mark B. at the Hudson Valley. And, and he said, I think he was still the same way. When I got to college also, I wanted to do it so bad. Like, I just wanted to play. And when I didn't get a chance to play in the league, I stayed in the house for about two months when I got cut and I couldn't do anything. I was just depressed. You know, I put everything into wanting to do that. But a guy had a different plan. You know, he had a different plan. But, you know, I just wanted to play in the National Football League. Um, 
That's what I thought I was going to end up doing. I thought I got happy just because. Then we realized this world was a lot busier than where I was at. So there was a lot of guys that could play football and I was spot so I thought I was Did you have any, any backup plan or it was that was it? I was from I'm from the hood. <laughs> so the other plan is to go get money outside in my favor. <laughs> if I came, I was in uh, Nah, I didn't have no backup plan. I didn't know anything. I went to school for criminal justice because it was very really simple. And I thought I would learn all the all the laws that all my friends did get in trouble. So I went to school for criminal justice. I'm literally the reason that I took my media in college, I went to, I wouldn't dare let my son go. Like, you know, it was just, I wasn't so doing that. I thought I would be, but I would go in the National Football League or I would somehow make a whole lot of money doing the evil things outside. Coach, you have a soft spoken, easygoing way about you. But you've been described as the best recruiter in all of college football. Most people have this image of a slick, fast-talking, used car salesman when it comes to recruiting. But you are the antithesis of that. So, what is your secret? Honesty. Straightforward and honesty. There's no sugar code in anything. And as I talk to you like that, you'll understand in order I'm telling you the truth. I don't have time to do anything. And no lies. So most of the coaches sell you this big dream. I'll just tell you these are things that could happen. You know, this is how you can get into clean. This is how I stay on track here too. And I just continue to do it. You know, I just go look at the track. Like there's a lot of guys that come most, all the guys that come to school, except for one, every guy that has ever came to school for me has gotten educated. So I'm one guy, you know, and I make sure I stay on him. And I don't just recruit my position. I've been recruiting the entire city a long time. I'm, I'm, I want to know, and I'm going to let my dad, I don't know if he, he might already have this, but I want to know about 12 years to go from showing up every day at Temple to the head football coach at Syracuse. It's pretty wild. Yeah, it work. Most it's people work. GA for whatever, four, eight years, and then they get a first shot somewhere. And anyways. I've been pretty good at recruiting. And then you got to think I did grow up in New Jersey, so I saw a lot. I was around a lot of guys that technically were business owners, you might mean looking for of that nature. Um, <laughs> just getting to see the business. You know, I've been around Coach Rule. He showed me a lot of stuff. Then I got a chance to go work with Greg Smirno. Then I get a chance to work with Kirby Smart. So I was just sponging those guys. Just being around and just being sponge, being sponge. And I understood and knew what I wanted, though. It was like, I, I never wanted to be a coordinator. Never wanted to go do these other little pieces, be the special teams coordinator. It was like, no, I want to be a coach. And that's what I'm aiming at. That's what I'm going to do, and that's like all I see. I didn't see all the other things. I didn't see all the things to side. When people would try to tell me, um, hey, we'll have to use this first. Okay, I got you. My father won't talk to them that much. They, they didn't have the same vision. They got to be in my people with food, and we'll be not negative people. So I just kind of knew who would say what. And then, okay, cool. I'll stay away from you, and I'll stay in the league that I need to be in, or it's all positive, you know? Because at the end of the day, guys, we'll make a decision of where we're supposed to be, not our union. So it was just the fact that you put me work in and you shown what I can do. And you know the nature of the business just now, I can hear it, I can recruit good and good. And I was coaching the second at a high level. So when I did both of those things, if the food is those things, even now while I'm the head coach at a high level, then it'll bring success to the field game. So I think that's what um, that's why I climbed it. Because you know, a lot of coaches are lazy, though. Like, everybody always coach and they work all day. They sit in the office and talk to the other coaches about Three and a half hours in his school. There's so much BS that go on business coaching. Why do you do it? It's not really good. Yet. When I worked in Georgia, I really saw, like, okay, it was birth and go home. Put the work in and then go hang with your family. You know, I watched Toby Smart do that the right way. And I was like, okay. And they said that he did it his way. You know, he wanted to do it a certain way. And we're really mighty enough because we worked. You know, what? Like, like, yeah, I think we've done it. was one game in a couple of years. So, like, why would I do it another way? You know, go the other way about it. I just watched the new job say, it's like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. You implement so many own things, but you want. You know, I got my own style, my own little swag about silly things that ain't going to be everything I watched him do because it worked well. And I watched how he implemented his family into it also. You know, and that, that, that's what I respected most of all. And then sure guys had time to be in the Watch their coaching. Did, did, uh, did Coach Smart have the biggest impact on you, would you say, 
as a as a on your coaching journey. No, not in life, but yeah, my coaching journey a lot of that. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was just because if I didn't go work the crew spot, I wouldn't be a coach. One of my last from the game shows when he had that. It's him validating who I am and what I can do. The big name most people want to listen to. So without a doubt, I'll ever go coach more. So, Coach, you, you got promoted from uh, defensive backs coach all the way to head coach, which, as you said, has kind of skipped a couple skipped a couple of rungs on the ladder of the coaching tree, uh, the coaching ladder. So when you get promoted like that, something I always wondered about with coaches is you see like good defensive coordinators or offensive coordinators become head coaches. And then they hire, you know, they hire someone to call the plays and other coaches, they would, they keep calling the plays. What went into your decision-making about, you know, recruiting, coaching defensive backs and, you know, why you decided to do what you, you're doing in Syracuse? Let's keep going. I'm not going to stop them. And they continue to do that. I don't see one here. Yeah, we, you know, I think I'll be developed. I think you got to do that. It's going to coach on. Safety he does a really good job. Uh, coach still safety. And that young guy ain't come up against you. You'll be gone. And I'm going to coach the corners. I'm, I'm going to do that myself. And I'm going to admit, I would shoot. The crew and every run that we have, not just saying by myself. And I just be every fight that's committed, that will be committed, that will. Well, I'm in the mix. When it comes to the crew, I'm full still in it. You know, I'm going to do a little bit more. But, you know, that's what we need to do right now. Anyway. Until we, until we are, I don't think I'll stop that. And I, it's fun. It's competitive. I need to talk to Bob the Jeep. Like, yeah, the crew's going to all work. Now I have to do that in so I mean, it's fun doing before. So it's like that. Hey, it was so nice to wear a top. Hey, are you going to have a up? That's so you still be on the do that, you know? I don't need to shoot five hours. It is five and a half. I'm good. And we did. Coach, did I hear you say that you know Deion Sanders? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. He's a good dude. You know what? When I got the job, I called him and I was talking to him and asked him a lot of questions. And he's been so helpful. I texted him all yesterday because... I went to the Triple A team and I had to throw baseball. And he was, his picture was out there in the building. He played right here. And he was like, Yeah, that was my last stop before Dan Snyder and Washington and Brung him off and ended up throwing this way. Just talked to me about that, sending text. But really just a good person, a competitive man. But just was telling me all the things that I should do, you know, for what he'd done the first year. And I was asking questions. He's always oh, very, getting a bunch of information. I'm always falling and asking questions. You know? So as you know, I mean, I know when it's when Shiloh was coming out of high school because I was coaching the secondary at Bell. So we ended up first meeting there and just talking a lot, thinking about trying to take Shiloh in fitness. If if you don't mind sharing, I know it's personal, but do you mind giving us what what advice did he give you? Um, do what you want. Stay focused. Keep God first. I was the main thing. Just do what you want. Keep God first and go get big guys. You know, they said, you know, you got to get big guys. And you want to invest in the big guys. There was some other things he told me about the portal and stuff like that. But don't even know things the doors the way, God first, and go get the big guys. You know, what I was still doing for it. You know, I said, I was, I'm trying to find you. I don't know if I'm out there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he wanted to call. He said, I don't know if I'm out there anymore. Troy, will you tell Coach about my connection to Dion? Yeah, I mean, I think I think he coach probably knows a little bit, but you played. My dad played with Dion in, in Atlanta, and uh, they they became good friends. And there's there's one really good story that uh, they asked Dion to to do a I think it was a Burger King commercial. It was it Burger King, Dad? It was Nike. They were, they were doing a commercial, and they said to my they said to Dion, they're like, "Hey, Dion, we want we want you to come, and we want you to bring some of your brothers." And really, they wanted like other black players, and so Dion showed up, and my dad was there as one of the one of the brothers. And they're like, "Dion, we didn't want him; we wanted brothers." He goes, "This is my brother. This is Tim." <laughs> <laughs> There's been a bunch of a uh, bunch that of good stories of. Yeah, I mean, actually, did, did your father play with Kevin Ross? I can't remember, Dad. Did you, did you play with Kevin Ross? No, but I played with Mike Rosier. I'm pretty sure he was a Camden guy. I know Mike was here too. He's from Camden. You got to know Mike well. He won a, well, he won a um, Heisman Trophy, played at Nebraska. We called him Rosie. He was a wonderful guy and teammate. All right, now let's talk about Syracuse. Please tell everyone how you got the job at Syracuse University 
because you weren't even in consideration for the job, right? I think any listeners who are parents will want to share this story with their kids. Hey, um, so I wasn't in a race. I seen it. I looked at it and I kind of bothered me. A little upset about that. So what I did is um, I asked this agent I had. I said, can you give me John Wise? Give me the AD's number. I didn't know it was John Wise. I said, give me the AD's number. And I called somebody else, told them to get me the AD's number. Um, they got me the number. I called the agent and answered. And I shot him a text, told him who I was. And I said, could you just give me 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes? The best way to find out about Frank Brown is through Frank Brown. He got on the call. That 10 minutes went for about a half an hour, supposedly. We talked for a half hour. Then on Christmas, I mean Thanksgiving, he wanted to talk to me again for about 25 minutes. He said, give me another 30 minutes. That went for like an hour and 45. And then it just kind of went to it. I went for the interview. You know when you go to do something like something, you knew you knew those games where you know like, okay, I'm gonna kill this deal. I mean this tight this tackle. He can't block me. Like it was kind of like I was just in a zone. And I answered every question. I knew all the old book. I just knew everything the right way. And then when he just ended up um, you know, God God just wanted me to be the head coach at the time. You know, it was meant to happen, but I called it myself. I did it myself. I took the initiative. I'm getting everything done myself. Like my agent and those guys didn't find out about the interview or me getting a job until after I got the job. Then I called them and said, could you uh, just work to uh, make sure the writing is all correct? You know, I did the, how much I'm going to get paid. I did everything. You know, I did everything on my own and just let them read the paperwork. I, mean, I, was, I didn't want nobody to mess this up. No one knew but me and my wife. You know, we you kept it between us. We let nobody know it. That's awesome. I never, I've never even heard of that. What, what uh, what made you think to just call him direct like that? Because last time I didn't get the job, and, like, I didn't know what people were saying. You know, like, hey, just got, and not too worried. I got a good representation, I guess. Like, the face door, bro, it represents a lot of guys. So they throw them five people. And what if I'm not next up in their opinion? And then, you know, I'm working for one of the best programs in the country. I'm the number one recruiter in the country. That guy might want me to stay with him, too. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It's different pieces. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go do this myself. I'm going to go and I'm going to make this work myself. So I just went and called and I done everything on my own. Got hit him up, did <laughs> myself, talked to myself, went doing on my own. I love it. Yeah. Only Elijah Robinson knew because he was interviewing for the A&M job the same time I was interviewing for Syracuse. We went in together. We prayed together. And then we both went our way for the interview. They don't call each other afterwards. He said, how do you do? I said, I think I killed it. So how do you do? He said, I think you killed it. I said, well, hopefully we both get it. If not, we're coming with each other. Somebody's going with the other one. It's kind of just all made itself work like that. Yeah, that's, that's an awesome story. I never heard that before. Seriously, I love that drive. Coach Brown, it's been a real pleasure getting to talk to you. Good luck this season. And more importantly, may God continue to bless you and your family. I appreciate that, but before I hang up and you get off, I got about three questions that I got to get you to answer for me because I just want to know because, uh, of course, you being from Liverpool and me recruiting close to the area, I'm already starting to get a couple other guys. Like, you being a hometown kid, you know, and being from Liverpool, can you walk me through the recruiting process for you? And, like, what made you comfortable with, like, staying home and picking Syracuse? Really, it was simple. George O'Leary was my high school coach for two years, and God knows why, but I love the man. He was the defensive line coach at SU when I went there. I also wanted to stay close to home. I have always felt a strong connection to upstate New York, the people, the community, just the whole area. Coach O'Leary and Coach Mack's vision to get the football program back on track also excited me. Well, he's a good coach. You're a good coach. You, you CEF, too. I think you turned that program around. They did some great things with Frank Borders. I, we, uh, when I was at Temple, we wanted to get some a bunch of times. And he was just a really good football coach. And they, all right. Can you tell me, what was your favorite memory as a player at Syracuse? I'll go with one as an athlete and one as a student. My favorite time as a player was the Nebraska game. At that time, they were the program everyone wanted to be like and were stomping anyone they played. The Dome was absolutely deafening, and we stunned the whole country with that win. 
My favorite time as a student was dinner at my academic advisor's house with some famous writers. Along with dreaming to be in the NFL, I was always enamored with books and dreamed of one day becoming an author. It was actually the most important goal to me growing up. Ah, no wonder you write all these books. <laughs> wow, that's cool. All right, so listen, tell me about the Nebraska game. The Nebraska game was insane. We were 48-point underdogs to the number one team in the nation, and we beat them. I had two sacks, 10 tackles, and one forced fumble. I was Sports Illustrated Defensive Player of the Week. Over the fourth quarter, a sack. There's that Tim Green in there again. Number 72. They had a fumble at the end, but I think they just whistled already, boy. Ooh, that Green is quick off the ball. Well, there is size, there is strength. But then there is quickness. And you got to have quickness. Take a look at number 72. Beating his band, throwing him aside, getting right to the quarterback, sacking him for a big, big sack, starting the fourth period of play with Syracuse leading 10 to Coach, if you can get the fans to bring that kind of energy back to the Dome, they will help you win a lot of games. In the moment, we knew beating the number one team in the nation was a big deal, but I didn't realize the importance of that win for the program overall. I would say, I, I would say when we, when so growing up and even now, like when my dad, when I'm with my dad and we get stopped places or if I'm by myself, I get stopped. People talk about the Nebraska game more than anything else. He's done a lot of really cool stuff and he was a first round pick in the NFL and children's author and, you know, done a lot of philanthropy locally. I would say, you know, 10 to one, if somebody stops me, they're talking about the Nebraska game. That's cool. So you ask me, what was it like being a first round draft pick? You know, being drafted like the first round to the NFL. Being drafted in the first round was a childhood dream come true. When I was young, I watched football with my dad and fell in love with it. We really bonded over it, and I wanted to make him proud. Being a kid, I didn't realize how statistically unlikely it was. I just knew I wanted to do it. Dad, did you when you were young and you and you knew you wanted to go to the NFL? Did you care if you were like, did, was your dream to be a first round pick or was it just to make it to the NFL? I know you didn't have anything pre typed for that, but I want, I'm interested. I want to know for me. It was always the first round. So what, it was the first round then. Oh, you called your shot. Uh, let me ask this real quick. What would you message do to the recruits as to why they should come to Syracuse? I would tell them Syracuse is a great place to come. Here are the first things that come to mind. First class education, first class living accommodations, first class schedule, first class facilities, and a first class head coach. I need you to speak to me all the time. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> you, must have sent them, you must have sent them the $5 directly. I was trying to negotiate. Yeah. I was trying to negotiate the fee and you must have called each other direct. You, you took a page yeah. out of your playbook. All right, let me get this. Two more questions, unless you got more, because I got some other ones that we have written down, and I wanted to make sure I asked you this. What made you settle down here, like, like through a life after the NFL? Like, all the places, all the money you made. You were first round, you were in Atlanta. You could have went anywhere in the world. Like, what made you settle down here for life like that? Syracuse was always home. My wife, Alyssa, and I shared the same goal of having a big family and making our kids our priority. And I wanted to live on the water. Even when I was playing for the Falcons during the NFL offseason, I was going to Syracuse Law School. After law school, we found a piece of property for sale on one of the Finger Lakes and built a big house to fit all of our kids. After that, we just stayed. This is what I'm cool. It's really cool. Let me ask you, so I got a 19-year-old. I got a 11-year-old and I got a two-year-old. What books are you telling them to read of yours? I'd recommend two. Unstoppable is a story based on a true story of a young athlete who loses a leg to cancer, but that doesn't stop him from fulfilling his dreams. The second recommendation would be my number one New York Times bestseller, Final Season, which is based on my family's struggle coming to grips with my ALS diagnosis and the effects it had on my youngest son's football career. Uh, I got a coach two more on this. Oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Too much. Uh, being a college coach is like being a CEO now. All right. So it's a big difference. What advice would you have 
mix around my team, the players, coaches, and the staff from the staff's perspective. Ask the players to do only what their skills are capable of. Don't spare your coaches. They must be excellent in everything they do. And last but most important, treat the coaching staff like family. Thank you. Thank you a lot. I appreciate that. Coach, I got one more thing for you, too. One of the things that was important to us about the podcast is we didn't want to make it about just football or just sports or just ALS or, or any of that stuff. We wanted to make sure we talked to a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds and stories and all that. So I want to put you on the spot here. What, who is somebody that we should connect with? Who's somebody you know that you think um, we should have on to tell their story that, that people would want to hear? Just a bunch of people I know. But I don't see someone that you guys can put on it. You'll go. I would say you to your phone as you'll be a lot of you obviously. He's on it. He's senior. It could be smart. Yeah, those are two good ones. Yeah. And I got to get one last thing, Coach. If, if uh, must champ also. Who's that? Will Muschamp. Will Muschamp? Okay. Will Muschamp plays a major part. You just keep staying confident and push, push him to go be a head coach. Like he was really literally like an uncle. But two straight years ago, sure. No one treated me better. And I'm no one like, I know that man loved me. You know, and he did that for me for two straight years. He's done that for a lot of people. So I would really say the best one, probably the real question. That you just down the earth and just get, just gets life. You know, you love his family, you love his kids. Just gets it, you know. I'm going to follow up with you after we get their contact info. Yep. Coach, last, last thing, if someone's listening to this and they're a fan of Syracuse football or maybe they – they haven't watched in a while, and and uh, you know what would you say to them? What what do you say to the fan of why they should tune in this season? If you like football and content, you should watch this play. It's going to be by the end of the game the way the game is supposed to be played. You want to play the game the way winners and the four winners go play. So now you shouldn't say that from me up, but that's how we don't play the game. We don't play five. You know those four D linemen play though. Oh yeah, you know he wants seven minutes. Like what is your he has a lot to speak for because all four of those guys got a chance to play after out of college. All four of these guys play in the NFL and they're all good men. And that's what we're trying to mimic how they live their lives. They'll still do do ever do it that way the way those four words darn it. Because me and Lefall those got those guys had some long careers. I think the show might have been somebody which was two and a half. It cost a long time when they got the full long family. And then that, that's how we want to play the game. But I can say you should watch it because you're going to bring that old school flavor back. You know, I'm one of people. Awesome. Thanks so much for the time, Coach. I appreciate y'all. Thank you so much, Mr. Green. I really appreciate this. Sure, thanks a lot, Sam. And hopefully I'll see you up here. We've got free practice this Saturday. And I'm not practicing this very day, but you guys got to open them. But just let me know when you come and I'll make sure that we need this card that I'll Awesome, and we're going to have to do a follow-up one after we have a big season, too. Let's make a deal. If you will bring your wife and kids to a day on the lake, then I will go to one of your practices. I'm going to do that because I got a lot of licking up to do with my wife, so when we show up, let them up. My two-year-old is bad as that. She does not listen to me like at all, so. But I'll definitely do that, especially during this time. And a working out, I would be dating. Like, I would definitely like to come out there and go out and then I'll catch you in the summer. So I'll come before, I'll come first, then you come second. I've got a three year old that doesn't listen to me either. So actually, I got a five year old, a three year old, and a one year old that all barely listen to me. So be, you'll be in good company. Oh, I'm in the same place. I mean, I guess I'm doing a good job. There. So <laughs> I, I mean, this is it's bad. They don't listen to anything I say. They just ask their mom. I'll say, no. Yeah, I hear a mom. I'm like, Listen, no. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, but listen, thank you all so much for having me on here. Tell me, I mean, it's really an honor to be on here with you. Just a legend, the Hall of Fame here. Just first rounder. You got to play get the game the right way. We're going to play the game the way you want to see it play and eliminate all those damn things. You know? So, hey, Josh, you and I appreciate you guys. Story. Thanks a lot, bro. Awesome. See you, coach. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green, and I have ALS. 
This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son Troy each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the Northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarkleyDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barkley Damon for supporting this podcast and, of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.